So I'm, I noticed that most of the samples you had that had the drug-resistant virus were among people whose viral load was so low that they'd be unlikely to transmit anyway. They were below a thousand, um, and so I think that's really that kind of makes the the threat even less. I think, um, and I'm also wondering if you have any thoughts on why you're seeing more resistant strains in people who are below a thousand than people who are above a thousand? Those are, those are great, great points. Um, so yes, so this, this like for example, the 1% of, of people who resistant to the mutation to tenofovir, that's all of them. And the, so the encouraging thing is that this number of all comers is already low, 1%. And if someone has this resistance but their viral load is low, the risk of, of transmitting it is, is low. And, and luckily most people, like as you said, are in this low viral load category. Um, as to why so many people have uh, this low virus, um, you know, I, I'm, not, I'm not totally sure. I want to ask Susan. Sorry, Susan, I'm going to walk over to you. Hi, my guess is that these are people who have ever had mutations of this type. And then the viral load is their most recent viral load, I'm going to guess. So we've done such a great job of getting people on therapy. And even if you have a mutation, you can still get suppressed. So that's why someone may have ever had an M184V and falls into that category. Joanne answered. <laughs> Again, I'm Susan. And um, I think that the proportions that you see up there for people who have those mutations is not that different from the overall population and that um, we're just, most people are suppressed with HIV in King County. We're, you know, very successful getting people into care, on care, stay on care, and suppressed. Great, thank you. I'm just curious how the resistance rates that you showed from King County uh, compared to the rest of the U.S. or the rest of the world? Sure. Good question. Um, so, um, this is just sort of digging into my just residual knowledge. Um, uh, part of the impetus for starting free treatment drug resistance testing in the U.S., as far as I understand, is you know, say in the mid 2005 ish, um, there were some studies that showed like 25% prevalence of transmitted drug resistance among MSN in New York and similar numbers in Switzerland. And so that kind of opened up like, whoa, this is big. And I don't know if at the time, I, I think that the, the pre-treatment drug resistance testing got officially put into the US guidelines in 2008. Maybe we were doing it beforehand, but I think that's when it went into the guidelines. Um, so that was kind of like at the high. And, um, but I'd say in general, probably at least 10% is pretty common uh, throughout the U.S. And um, so in Kenya, well, so East Africa, um, levels vary from like 10 to, like the, there was a WHO report from last summer that had Uganda at 18%. Um, some data we have in Kenya was like at 14%. Um, so I wouldn't say much higher than than that. So it's, I'd say it's very, in the range, so that you, as you saw, it's, uh, you know, 10 to 20 percent, that's, it's pretty consistent with, yeah. When we compare the King County data to other areas around the country, um, our level of NNRTI resistant is much, much higher, and that's in part due to a cluster of um, 70 or more people who all have linked HIV infections that happen to have you know, very persistent NNRTI resistance, but the uh, NRTI resistance in Key County is comparable all around the country on the various um, 
jurisdictions that do that testing. Hi everybody, I'm Deja. Um, one of the one of the most persistent like fears and worries that I've encountered and that I myself had when um, like the first time I, my my provider told me I should be on prep maybe like eight years ago was some idea that if you start it but can't maintain it, you're going to be at greater risk than you were to begin with. Um, and this whole conversation of drug resistance and how it can be acquired and the things that may actually be going on behind the scenes are definitely leading me to think, okay, I can see how that might be a fear or whatnot, depending on levels, depending on um, whether you have access and is steady and consistent over years and years of time. Um, so I just wondered how that plays out like in the actual facts rather than just the hearsay. Sure, no, that's a great, thank you, that's a great question. Um, uh, so I should say full disclosure, so while I am a, a physician, I, I, I'm a pediatric doctor, so I I'll sometimes treat little kids with HIV, so I, I myself don't have much experience counseling people on PrEP, so I just want to make that clear. Um, but, uh, no, I, I think, I think he, you're, you're right, so um, in general I would say it's, it's good whether you're going on PrEP or whether you're going on ART, if for someone that has HIV, you, you want to go on it if, if you think you're going to take it consistently. Um, I think the risk with PrEP is um, if, if adherence is, is not so great, um, if, if someone's lucky enough to not get infected, then you're, you're not going to, of course, develop resistance. Um, uh, if, if you happen to get infected and, and the adherence is meeting sort of in the middle, then, then some, that person would be at, at risk. Um, but, you know, I think that would be like a conversation to have with, with like a, with a clinician that you know. Yes, Steve. Can I have food? Yes, please. I'll just add. This is. I think this is a place where the, the previous talk and this one come together, right? Which is um, at least one of the two mechanisms here of, of acquiring HIV while on prep. Right. The whole the, the first talk went through the cases we know and those that we don't know, right? and those, those represent this kind of question of, um, uh, we focused on, on the three of uh, people who are fully adherent, or seemingly fully adherent to PrEP, and, yet, and two of them got resistant, acquired resistant virus, anyway it seems. You know, underneath there, there's some other number of people in all the different tri in trials in different cities that over time, or different places over time, who've gotten HIV, who've acquired HIV, even while partially Partially, and the simple answer is we don't know how many there are, um, and we'd love to know how many there are, but it's so, but it's it's really hard to to know. And so I think one of the themes, of, one of the big themes of this of this set of this day is what we know and what we don't know. And that would be the number we would want to know out of how many people are out to be able to put something on there. And so, so instead of ending up with these fuzzy answers like, so <laughs> you know, it's possible, not very likely. Not a, you know, not at all likely, really unlikely. We, you know, I, 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 I don't know. And it's not because we're not looking or trying to know. It's that it's really hard to, to, to figure these out. And then when it involves you know, collecting data from health systems all over the world and put it together to, to get at these very rare events and figure out are they extremely rare or just moderately rare, it's, it's, it's a lot of work. So I guess that, that's all I have to say. So, um, both speakers mentioned, thank you for a wonderful talk. It's not easy to present uh, daytime mutations. Thank you. Um, what I wanted to ask you is in terms of like um, diagnostics and um, being able to assess treatment failure, and um, what, what exactly, if you, if you, is it possible that you could be infected, you could go on PrEP and sort of be on treatment and have your viral load suppressed and then only when you you miss a pill, you have like viral load rebound and so... Like would you miss the, the diagnosis of HIV because the virus is suppressed? Right. Right, great question. So luckily the answer is, is no because so if, if you have someone on PrEP who presumably doesn't have HIV, then you get HIV. The test that is being done ideally every three months 
is, um, is not looking for the, the, the number of viruses, it's, it's a, ideally an antibody antigen test. So you're looking for antibodies to HIV um, or, or an antigen. And that's separate from looking for at how many copies of the virus um, there are. Right. But, but if, you, if, you, if you gave PrEP early enough before sort of like viral replication took off, and is it possible that you wouldn't, you wouldn't develop like antigens and antibodies and you'd, you'd um, kind of be like on treatment? I see. I see what you mean. I, I don't think so. Joanne probably knows better. Um, it's conceivable, right? And there's been a lot of th these people who have acquired HIV when thought to be adherent. Two of them had an undetectable uh, HIV levels when they looked, so they were found by a positive uh, antibody antigen test. So there are some people who can remain suppressed while on two drugs. We don't know if they those two would have remained suppressed or if they would have ultimately broken through their their two drug therapy. Some people have low levels and easy control. So there's no absolute. Yeah, yeah, both of those. And diagnostics in prep is something that I'm interested in, but I don't think we're going to really talk about it unless people want to. I think it was more specifically mentioned in the Amsterdam case. In the poster, they went over that rationale and that reasoning. In the Amsterdam case, um, they go over in the poster for the Amsterdam case, they actually go over because they tested viral load and antibody, and they, there's actually a little small description about that, so. Huh? And what was the results? Can you sum up? Do you remember? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, I believe, <laughs> so, well, okay, well. Okay. Uh, so, I think it's, again, speculative, but um, they think that maybe there was enough crack in the rectal tissue to wore off infection, and when they discontinued it from crack, the infection became systemic. <laughs> <laughs> All right, this is, no, no, this is the problem I'm trying to get younger people to talk rather than me. Uh, so, he, the Amsterdam person had negative peripheral viral load, so negative in the plasma, negative in the cells, which is extremely unusual, negative rectal tissue biopsy, negative something else. And it was only after he stopped all his antiretrovirals, including his PrEP, that he actually developed detectable levels, which is why there's some concern that maybe he acquired HIV after all of this studying happened. Um, the second one also had some strange testing, which I don't recall as much, but they, they've all been a little bit strange. There's a paper in, in sort of submission stage right now where the CDC is reviewing diagnosis in, uh, in PrEP and sort of how things can be sort of strange. Thanks for your question. I hadn't, I hadn't thought about that. <laughs> Hey, thanks for the presentation. Very good stuff. Uh, is it conceivable if more drug combinations for PrEP kind of came out that we'd be talking about like potential failures more than just what's attached to Truvada? Truvada? Yeah, I guess so. I mean, um, yeah, if, you, if we were using a wider range of drugs, then, um, then yeah, you would, we'd be at risk for having resistance due to PrEP in the population to a wider range of drugs, that percentage, that proportion might still be pretty low. Um, but, uh, but yeah, so I think, I think so. Um, and to be honest, I don't, I don't know what sort of um, the thinking is if, if, if there's ever a thought to use other drugs, or I, I think we're gonna stick with these for a while, but I think so. Um, is the challenge with standardizing um, drug levels, like as a biometric measurement, right? Is that is that is there a challenge with ha doing that because of the ways that you collect samples, because of the way that um, people's sorry, <laughs> you're trying to, because does the CDC have any like guidelines as to doing that? Because I think that would be a great way. To apart from doing you know regular HIV testing and um, 
you know, other lab work, that that would be included in the regular fall. But is it because of the fact that? I think part of the issue is the lab, right? So it's not a routine test. Right? It's not like I'm going to go get a pregnancy test at Quest or I'm going to go do whatever at Lab Corps. There's few labs that do these validated tests. And so, uh, you know, there's uh, Angela Kashuba and there's Pete Anderson that do it in Colorado and I think she's in North Carolina. Yeah. Uh, and the hair tax, the only lab that I know of, and it could be different, this is, this is a couple years old, is in San Francisco. So uh, there's limited supply. Okay. Uh, and there's also, I think, limited knowledge on providers that these tests are important, which is why I think the conversation today around what do we really need to fare these failures. Um, and yeah, I mean, we, you know, dry blood spots are a great specimen. You do a right. finger prick, you let it dry, you put it away. So it would be fabulous if you started standardizing kind of simple collection of hair. I mean, I wouldn't want a provider cutting my hair, but I think some people are open to doing it. Um, so I think that there are specimens that are better, that are alternatives and are not that hard to collect. I think that getting the knowledge out there to collect them, and then the other thing is the, the supply of testing them. Right, because my thinking is like, if we can't figure out like as we're working with the individual and seeing what level of adherence they are at, then we can try and figure out, get to the person before resistance because of and we're, whatever. We're trying to get to point of care. To, we're trying to get to a place where we can do point of care right. to run a testing, but that does not currently exist. Although I'm working with Paul Crane, who's another investigator at the University of Washington. He got funded last fall to develop a point of care test for urine and finger stick. And we're probably going to bring it to acceptability and feasibility testing at Gay City in year three because we're a year three project. Now, point of care is for? For ten off of your testing. Oh, so to be able to tell people you have some number, again, this is a test currently in development, using antibodies just like a pregnancy test, right. to be able to say you have levels consistent with two or four or seven doses a week in urine and finger stick, again. Way ahead of the curve, a couple of years. Our next forum, our next workshop will be talking about this, but um, this is in plan for a couple of years from now. I think importantly, we banked on these specimens and we told, asked people, like, how useful is this result? And we're like, oh, it's useful, but you told me, like, how here I was weeks ago. It's not that useful. And so, really, the demand, we did a lot of interviews about, like, to, you know, what did you do with that information? And the temporality or how close it is to taking it, I think, is really key for folks, which kind of common sense for everybody. You want to know, is it in my body now? Not was it in my body you know, weeks ago. So getting a point of care tests are really important. Yes. Or a home test. We have time check. We have about eight minutes left. So take your questions. Hi, we, we had a hard time. You did a great job of translating resistance to people. So did people understand Horacio's talk, or are people sort of overwhelmed by the talk? So, understood? I understood everything in the talk, or most everything in the talk? <laughs> I, I still have no clue about drug resistance. And somewhere in the middle? Okay, those of you in the middle, what questions do you have? So one thing that I wasn't clear on is, so of the two cases where there was transmission, <coughs> even though the person was on PrEP, have we been able to identify where it was suspected drug resistance? Have we been able to identify whether or not it was true body or antitranscipient? Mm. Oh, you mean uh, whether it was tenofovir or antitranscipient? Yes. I, it's, so in the first two, it was both. So tenofovir and antitranscipient. Uh, 
well, I was going to say you've never talked about drug resistance, but regardless, is there a greater risk for um, transmission or acquiring or drug resistant mutations, whatever it may be, complications with HIV um, with someone who starts it and knows ahead of time that they won't be adhering, knows that it will be inconsistent for whatever reason? Okay, good question. So, uh, so the, uh, the risk of transmitted drug resistance that really depends on how likely it is that one's, if someone has a partner with HIV, how likely it is that that person with HIV has drug resistance. So if, um, if someone's adherence to PrEP is, is low, um, that person might get HIV, but the transmission of drug resistance is totally dependent on whether or not that person has um, resistance. And, and so that's, or, whether the partner has resistance and, uh, and so as we saw on the slide, something like 26% of people have uh, drug resistance. Um, the, whether or not someone develops, like gets infected with HIV and PrEP, so that if, if the adherence is low, then you can get HIV and, and yeah, you can, you can develop drug resistance. Huh? I mean, Um, so I think what you're asking is, what do I do? I know I'm not going to be adherent. Should I go on prep or not? And just to use an example, so I get questions from docs all the time, and one of the <coughs> cases that came up was, we have this heterosexual couple. The male partner is HIV positive the, and not taking medicines. They're both um, substance, using substances and not well adherent. She's been on prep before. She's not been adherent to prep before. Should we prescribe prep for her? And the answer is, as Vanessa showed you, that anticipated based on modeling, that with two doses you get 76% protect, protection. So it's not zero. You still get some protection. And so I, I don't think there's a right answer to your question. I think there is a risk-benefit balance. So if she thinks she could take perhaps some of the time, she'll get some protection. And the, but the possibility is small that if she takes it, she gets infected, that she then gets drug resistant. Was there a question about my comment? Yes, yes. Yeah. yeah, do you want to, Martina? I'm just gonna take advantage of a teachable moment here because that 76%, I think that's exactly the kind of thing that it becomes very difficult to interpret. So what I heard when she said that was she has 100 minus 76 percent chance of maybe getting infected over some period of time. It's not clear what that period is, but that's not what that means. What it means is relative to somebody who's not taking any drugs, whose incidence might be one or two percent per year, she has a 76 percent reduced rate of infection relative to that one or two percent per year. That's a very different statement, and even I was confused listening to that. And I think it's really easy to get confused, and I think it's even harder for people who are not familiar with understanding relative risk to immediately process that information. So it was just one of those moments where it's, it's worth recognizing. A number looks like 76% looks so easy to interpret, it turns out not to be that easy. Mm -hmm. If I may add, also, um, one of the things that I, I like to think of it as, or like the way that I understand it, is that you know we have all these individual cells, right? And uh, the more drug that we have in our system, the more of those cells that are going to be um, blocked from the HIV coming in. But the more HIV that we have in the blood, there's more chances for the HIV to get into cells. So when we're talking about this stuff, it's it's we have to like think about that in terms of levels. So like if if you're only taking a couple pills a week, but you don't have a lot of HIV that's coming into your system, then you're going to be, you know, like that's a, a less risky thing. But if you have, if you're with somebody who is not virally suppressed and you're having unprotected sex and you're skipping doses and only taking it like twice a week, then you're going to have a high level of HIV in your blood, but not a high level of drug to block the HIV. Is that a, a good summary for? Yeah, yeah, that's a great explanation. Yeah, thank you. Um, 
But even if somebody develops resistance, as long as hopefully they're getting checked every three months, then even if they do zero effort, they can be put on medication. That's not, and that way they won't. Absolutely. Um, and then this is another question that uh, somebody asked when I was uh, presenting at uh, Western Washington, and it was a really good question, and I could barely find any way to explain it. Um, so some videos that I had watched on how PrEP works, and it kind of simplified it so that people can understand it, basically um, putting a coating of PrEP over the T-cell so that when the virus goes to try and bind to it, it kind of like bounces off, right? And so, so what they showed was like, um, it bounces off and it gets swept away. And then I, I, I looked at all this, you know, uh, all these different articles and, and none of it actually explained like, well, okay, when you have those floating HIV cells, like what happens to it? Does the rest of the prep medication in the body actually destroy it because of virus? You know, once you have a virus in your body, it doesn't just disappear. Do, does the lymphatic system flush it out of the body? Um, what actually happens to those viruses that bounced off? Do they still keep living in the body for a while? And is there a direct explanation for that? Excellent question. I... I <laughs> but I have a couple ways, I, if that came up in our clinic, I would answer it in this way, which is um, we don't know exactly the way PrEP works. We think that PrEP, which is two HIV medications that fall into the class of nucleoside reverse transcriptase inhibitors, NRTI, we think that it probably works in the same way it does in HIV treatment, which is blocking that enzyme, if you want to show yeah, the, yeah. that picture again, um, blocking that enzyme, the reverse transcriptase enzyme, that as humans we don't have because we're DNA creatures and we go from DNA to RNA, we don't typically go backwards. So we don't have this reverse transcriptase enzyme. And the NRTI medicines work by basically acting as an A, you know, our DNA is A, C's, T's, and G's, right? Which I'm not going to remember my biochemistry, but it acts like one of those. And when it does, it stops the virus from making copies of itself. So rather than what you're describing as sort of coating the surface, which is how some of the other HIV medicines work, we think that it works in a slightly different way by basically not letting the virus make more copies of itself. Now, there may be other ways that PrEP works, like <coughs> changing how the protein mechanisms happen, or we don't know exactly what cells or what parts of the cell the, the medicine needs to be in, but that's how we think it works. Now, I, the question that you're asking is sort of what happens to the virus that gets in your butt and, and like what happens to that virus, right? I mean, and so, so what is the HIV if it's not in a cell that has a pretty short lifespan, if it's on the order of hours, if someone can, if someone, if you lab person is nodding, yes. Oh, the hours, so, so if it's there, it just dies. It can't make, within the body it dies and then, you know, the rectal sloughing or the whatever, it just goes away, it gets broken down. Um, but the question always comes up of like, you know, I'm on PrEP and I've bottomed and what if someone else tops me? Is there a virus there? Are they protecting? And the answer is, gosh, theoretically there's a risk if you're, you know, you're a bottom and you've got PrEP on board and you don't get infected, but the top could get infected. There's this theoretical risk. Oh my. Two people in a row. Two people in a row, right. You're in a group sex situation, you're bottoming. Person is HIV positive, tops you, HIV positive semen in your butt, someone else tops you immediately thereafter. Is that top at risk? Theoretically. But, you know, what's the, how do we quantify that? That's like falls into the. We need a study. God. <laughs> volunteer. We, people suggest the volunteers. We're not going to volunteers for that. But that is how I would answer your question. Did that answer? Okay. Thank you very much.